And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, coming, t coming to us straight from, hi straight from his long journey away from PAX Unplugged. Maybe I'll crash that party one of these days, but not this time. Come, and and I'm a, a member of Lynn Vander Stute, Lynn Vander Studios, currently kickstarting the Legacy of Ma the Legacy of Mana 5e World Guide, as well as a immersive book and novel for for the project, featuring characters from Greek Memories of Azor, all the things that we'll be delving into. The one the one and only Tommy M. Gofton, um, TM TMG to his friends. How you doing? How you doing today, man? Or tonight? I'm doing. Oh, I'm doing well. Yeah. Uh, just just crossed the border back in Canada after the extorted PCR testing measures our government put in place. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, they're enjoying their wine tonight. Um, we are uh, en route back. I am. Uh, it was good packs. It was a good packs for for sales and everything. It was a fun time. Yeah, I'll. Um... On one hand, on one hand, maybe I'll show up at Packs Unplugged one of these years. On the other hand, I don't want people screaming as it. Um, and go and going run for the hills. It's Blackzilla. What? Blackzilla. I'm six Who's six. Blackzilla. Um, oh God! There's, there's people that are tall like that. They don't worry. <laughs> Get down there. Yeah. In fact, I'm <laughs> I I know. It's just I. Whenever whenever I go to conventions, I'm the one. I'm the one giant in the, in a room full of five foot nothings. Oh, you'll be fine. They don't fight hard there. <laughs> Although Philadelphia's a bit of a rough and tumble, so. Um, yeah, I've, I um, I'm well, I'm well aware of Philadelphia's reputation as the only city, the only city in the U.S. to throw snowballs at Santa Claus. Pretty much. <laughs> oh. And then they take his candy. Yeah. But with it, but with that said, it's a bit of a tradition to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So. I'd like you to walk me through your introduction to role playing and what made it stick. Ah, okay. Well, actually, the big thing for me was that I actually um, developed this world before I got into Dungeons and Dragons uh, and role playing in general. I was a pretty obsessed, nerdy kid back into things like King Arthur and Conan and all that stuff. And I, mm -hmm. and uh, in those early '90s, playing Final Fantasy and stuff like that, and I was just really into all that until '93 when I was introduced to a friend of mine who asked me if I'd heard about Dungeons and Dragons before, and I, I hadn't. And uh, long story short, is I opened the book, took a look at it, saw the word paladin, and that was it. Mm -hmm. um, but the paladin back then was only a little paragraph, and wasn't uh, wasn't an actual class. So we, uh, I got involved. I, I started to convert my my world into these characters and stuff, and then some of my friends back then. I started creating characters which added to the world, and then it was very similar to Dragonlance at that point, where all of our adventures were quantified by the six attributes and all the proficiencies and, and secondary proficiencies and sacos and everything else. Uh, and every iteration of D&D and Pathfinder slash D&D uh, going forward, with the exception of 4th edition, not because I'm not a fan of it, sorry Rob, uh, Heinzu, but uh, because uh, I just missed out on that era. Uh, as I delved into other role-playing games. But every iteration after that sort of helped shape and build the world since the 90s. Mm -hmm. And then um, and then I uh, got into game design. They saw a dare and uh, met some friends along the way and uh, started designing games together. And then we uh, I, I came up with a couple iterations of this book, uh, each one at the various amateur levels of my career. And now I'm at a point where this is sort of like my, uh, my last hurrah slash giving it one good go and it's uh, very impressive so far I'm, mm -hmm. I'm happy with it I'm really actually happy with it for the first time systemically and uh, that's where I am and that's my very quick and brief humble beginning mm -hmm. now since you mentioned King Arthur I'm, I'm tempted I'm tempted to ask if your introduction was through was through the, was through any of the books the the old movie or um or and this is gonna this is gonna be a deep cut for my for my own childhood the Knights of Justice cartoon. Uh, uh, so for me it was it was a combination of uh, 
uh, The Once the Future King by T.H. White, but that came after the 1981 Excalibur with Nicole Williamson and Nigel Terry. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, that was where I began with it. And it was actually, I was actually into Final Fantasy before I got into uh, the Ethereum legend, and I, I just started attributing Knights of the Round Table to different characters from Final Fantasy. And I, I started blending them together to the point where I thought they were both connected in my weird and like sonically autistic child mind. I just started like thinking that they became the, the same universe. And then, mm-hmm. of course, Conan the Destroyer, Conan the Barbarian kind of took over. And uh, those, those in combination with Highlander, believe it or not, is mm-hmm. how this entire thing festered into what it has become today. So, with with that with that kind of thing in, with that kind of thing in mind, um, I think it'd be would it be fair of me to say that Legacy of Mana is leaning is leaning far more in the um, in the Gonzo slash um, Magitech end of fantasy. Well, you can definitely tell that the Ethereum Knight was was uh, crafted after Celeste and and the Runic Blade. Uh, there's definitely, there's definitely some hints in there, but, uh, it, it, like anything that you get inspired from in order to, you know, really make it your own, you just, you play and you mold with it until eventually you get, uh, you get something, you get something different and it becomes different in amoebas, you know, like any, any, anytime someone creates something, regardless of what it is, they, especially nowadays, they, they use iterations from other medias, for example, uh, Alien, the movie Alien was pitched as Jaws in a box in space, and it's like it's just Jaws in a box in space. But mm-hmm. in that format, it became its own iteration, it became its own individual idea, and grew from there. So yeah, the the Magic Techs had a big part of what I was doing, mm-hmm. but they were definitely they were definitely not uh, the only thing. It was more Final Fantasy IV or II uh, that had a lot more influence on what I was doing, and. And the Arthurian legend was all about that which you couldn't see, the magic that you couldn't see, mm-hmm. uh, which is where it was, and and was what, what uh, bad magic can do. Uh, and then Conan was really dark, so the magic there was actually quite absent, and the absence of it was, was sort of a big thing. I think Dark Sun had a big tone in there, too, because the Defilers and Dark Sun, every time they cast spells, they would drain the land to yeah. cast their spells. Uh, was a, a later edition when I looked at that and thought, oh my god, that's fantastic. That's very similar to these Ethereum Knights. And then, uh, and then there it was, Dark Sun. But Dark Sun was around before me even. So I think it was just, you know, a lot of people create cool things at different points in, in, in the universe, at different points in the world. And uh, sometimes people can create similar things and come together in culture and, and, and hopefully celebrate it. Otherwise, mm-hmm. you tend to, get the, tend to get people arguing about whether who was there first. But yeah. Yeah. Now, I would I would like to touch on on some of the on some of the conceptual features just just in u- in universe as well as um, as well as mecha- as well as mechanically, and one of the big ones that I want to touch on is this idea of mana and anti mana. Now, yeah. mana just fr- just from sh- just from sheer cultural osmosis, I can more I can more or less figure I can more or less figure out, but. Um, what is anti mana in this particular in this setting of Imaria? Well, we've got we've got two types of mana: convergence mana and uh, cosmic mana. Cosmic is stuff that's coming in like almost like an ozone or almost like a fume that's hitting and magnetizing to the earth, to the world, I should say. And then uh, it's getting converted into convergence mana, which is the type of mana that most wizard sorcerers, magic users, living breathing thing. It's like the force almost. It, it manipulates itself into this convergence mana. Um, anti-mana is what happens if you were to take convergent mana or cosmic mana in any of its forms, and uh, like a tree, take the oxygen and then, or take the CO2 of it and then poop it out as oxygen. Except in this case, we reversed it so that way the oxygen is actually toxic. And so uh, the anti-mana is the it's both the, the entropy, the, the energy lost, and the the changing of mana into something that is considered dead. And mm-hmm. so that's, that's our concept of antimatter, which can also be manipulated by organisms and beings um, in an interesting way until it is finally dissolved from existence, mm-hmm. which has profound effects on the ecosystem of the world. Yeah. And not, not just the biological ecosystem, but like the cosmic ecosystem of the world. Mm-hmm. Now, the other, th- the other thing I'd, wa- I'd want to cover is, um, cro- is chronomancy. Yeah, there's the heart. Because 
um, time tra time travel or even time manipulation is something that a lot of fantasy settings um, dip into, but never but never go all in on. And the 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 close thing I, the close thing I can think of in in terms of actually trying to dip into the consequences of it, um, putting aside the Shintiara setting, which is still in development, um, is the is the time magic and, and predictionism stuff in Ars Magica, where, th where there are very specific rules that if you break, you will end up pissing off a lot of people <laughs> um, using that kind of magic. Yep. So, chronomancy in this world is, uh, is a fearless use of it. It is, uh, the, w the way this world works is, when it was first terraformed, or whatever the cosmic genesis of the world is, uh, there was uh, angelic and demonic or fiend and celestial forces that were trying to bombard it in its infancy, and dragons uh, that inhabited the planet uh, needed to protect from these this invasion that were coming from moons. Mm -hmm. And this this the only way they could do this they were losing it's a losing battle, but the only thing they could do is is find a way to get buy more time. And how they did that was some of them sacrificed their essence to create what's, what we call the veil, which is a cosmic shell that or like uh, sorry a uh, Transdimensional shell that suspended the planet in time, mm -hmm. and so to fiends and gods and other, I'll say, spell jammer like things, like other like cosmic weave that tries to come to this to this uh, world, can't get through. It takes maybe to them it's like days or maybe even hours, mm -hmm. and inside the planet it's uh, hundreds of thousands of years, and so time changes between this this cosmic shell, and so what that means is that opens up because there is this this energy that is surrounding the, the, the planet and, and holding it in some sort of like weird uh, stasis thingy, um, it means that you can manipulate it. And so there are sages, we call them, which become dreamwalkers, chronomancers, and or channelers, have found ways to manipulate it. And all of, a lot of our subclasses are some dip into the time magic so they can do things to alter the ebb and flow of time. Mm -hmm. uh, of course... The veil also is attached to nightmaring and to darkness and getting lost in your own thoughts. So the, so the further uh, back and forward in time you go and the more you try to play with it, uh, the more dangerous it becomes to the fabric of your mind. So you, you can't just like go back and forth through time whenever you want uh, without, the, without the consequences being dire. And I mean like so much as manipulating a couple of seconds here and there, the further you go into that, it starts to get consequential. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, chronomancy for us, I personally am obsessed with the concept of time. I think it's amazing. Uh, I live in the present, uh, and, and, I, and I constantly, at the same time, in some sort of parallel way, I'm always thinking about what happens next, but I still enjoy my present, mm -hmm. and I love reminiscing about the past, and it all happens at the same time. So for me, the, that parallel universe, or whatever the hell that is, uh, has become an obsession, and I found a way to quantify it in the game. Mm -hmm. Now, for 5th edition mechanics, uh, as a game designer... Uh, working with some very accomplished game designers, uh, one of the things I wanted to do is not just add on damage and or you know whatever some of the some of the um, the designs could be. I really wanted to play with the concept of time in mechanical gameplay in a way that is smooth and, and easy to 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 manipulate. Uh, so that way you feel like you're manipulating time, even though what you're really doing is you're just playing with your agency in the game uh, in a way that doesn't break the game, but it allows you to play D and D in a new way. Mm -hmm. And that makes you feel like you're manipulating time a little bit, and that is the the look, tone, and feel. Mm -hmm. Now, I had also se I'd also seen that you have uh, you have gun you have gunpowder, and gunpowder ends up ends up adding a, ends up adding a whole new layer when it's introduced into fantasy games. So, what I'm curious about is when it comes to that level of gunpowder, what level of um, tech are we dealing with? Are we dealing with Early, are we dealing with an, equi an equivalent to early Pike and Shot? Are we dealing with um, an equi with an equivalent to the Wild West, or is it a ver is it a varied situation? It's varied. See, gunpowder and technology are areas where the veil and or mana are more void, and so it's it's like it'd be like how a desert forms without without water, and so without mana cultures that need to survive start to, you know, become a little more technologically reliant. And then when those two angles fuse together, you get that Final Fantasy feel where mm -hmm. you got technology mixing. So you got airships that, fl that fly with mana crystals, and then you have other airships that fly on steam, and they both have their advantages and disadvantages. Gunpowder 
and this is just a chemical reaction to certain things that can be enhanced with magic or manipulated in, multi- in the same way. It's like, imagine what our guns would look like today if we actually had magic. Right? It's a very different world. Mm-hmm. Now, we don't have, like, submachine guns and, like, Gatling guns and things that are very modern, and we don't really go near the Wild West. I think we go more toward that, uh, that, uh, that steampunk era of, of firearms. Steampunk meets, like, pre-renaissance or post-renaissance era, right? Yeah, that's, ki- that's kind of what I was hinting at when I, meant, when I brought up um, Pike and Shot. Yeah, just keep it keep it fantasy esque, right? That's what sort of what we've done, and but but do stuff with the gunpowder in unique ways, mm-hmm. like and, manipulating with mana. Yeah, we're at at an age where um where even re, even reloading a firearm took it took a heavy amount of skill to reload it quickly. Oh, um, because even even in the even even in the day, even in the early days of of the United States, um. You'd be lu- you'd be lucky if you could get more than one shot over the span of a minute. Right. We've we've obviously brought that up a bit so that uh, you know your experts and stuff are going a lot quicker. And we do have some repeating and stuff like that, but nothing nothing outside of you know previous D and D worlds firearms or firearm technology that that you know it, it's still mechanically valuable mm-hmm. compared to uh, you know an archer shooting five arrows in a map. We don't want to penalize the mechanics just because of the logics, but there's ways to make the logic work. Mm-hmm. And that's just that's just good game design, I think. Yeah. Now, when it comes to the, when, it com- when it comes to the um the ethni- the ethnicities in Ima- in Imaria, the I'd say yeah. one of the primary ones that I saw that I saw in the preview document were the um Z- were the Zion Ku, also known as the descendants, which yeah. Would it be fair of me to say that they're your, that they're your human equivalent, even though there's a whole lot of variation between them? They are human for all things. They're, they, if you were to quantify them in one way, they're diver, like, uh, diverse humans. They are. Uh, they're, they would be like uh, another variant human, if you want to call it that. But their their actual lore is that. Um, when, oh, there we go. Just moving to a storage locker here. Mm-hmm. Uh, when. So they're actually more inspired off of the old Birthright uh, Dungeons and Dragons setting, where mm-hmm. there was bloodlines. Except these bloodlines come from di- deities or divine beings, and in this case, the Zanku are coming from fiends and celestials that were trapped inside the veil when the veil was was put up. And over time, like generations in a vampire game, they've become weaker and weaker and weaker through their procreating, and eventually it became so dormant. This is how he- our humans were born. Our humans are. In fact, just descendants from uh, Fiend and Celestial. And the Zanku are a very select group of souls and spirits that, uh, that reincarnate themselves in a, in a very finite pool that have managed to survive the, uh, the test of time. And so they've got odd abilities and things that they can do that are more apparent. Mm-hmm. Now, within, within, within that, um, since you meant... Would it be would it be else given the whole given the whole mono relationship that they all have? Um, yep. I could see I could see some making some at making some analogs to Ganassi, even though it's not a one to one comparison. Well, I mean, anything in fantasy will have their comparisons. I mean, you could consider them closer to Asimars and Tieflings of Annie, mm-hmm. but uh, but in reality, they are, are honestly variant humans that are just that mechanically and in terms of like lore wise it's our way to connect them to the natives of the moons that have caused the entire world to come into being yeah and they're you know they're they're like vulcans to humans in sci-fi they're pretty much the same damn thing Mm -hmm. but one's got ears and green blood yeah (laughs) (laughs) and uh, and you do you did dip into the rls are different trope by having elves with wings oh yeah yes so the Ariel elves and our, our types of elves, like we don't have drow, but we have deep elves. Deep elves are, are from the underground, but they're not inherently evil. And they don't worship spiders. Um, they are, our elves are, we have, we have what's called the caretaker races. And the caretaker races are the ones that were there when the planet was being terraformed. And the planet is actually just an inverted seed of dragons. Mm-hmm. I don't want to give away too much. Uh, it was a seed that was floating through the cosmic universe 
that got caught in a mana flow between two moons that exude, exude um, what's the word? Exuded mana. Mm-hmm. And it got caught like a, like, a, like, a, like a bug in a web. And then the shell of the, of the, of the planet absorbed mana enough to, to cause what we like to call it for fun, a popcorn event where the world terraformed and the cosmic caretaker races, the elves, goblins, uh, dwarves, uh, basically the classic um, Lord of the Rings sci-fi brand, mm-hmm. uh, orcs, were take, had their, all their positions and stuff. And, and this is like the major religion of it, right? Um, the major, the major like uh, genesis of it. We're taking care of these dragon seeds, and uh, humans were born from these celestials. And so, that uh, that whole mix, you know, the the different types of elves and stuff, happened because of where they were in this world, and they adapted to their environment. Mm-hmm. Now, and if, now when it comes to when it comes to the introduction of. Of the um of the more anthropomorphic, um, ra- um races in the ge- in the game like the lupine and the vulpine, what what gave you the idea of you of of having an entire having an entire set of ne- of nemals as they're referred to? Uh, I was obsessed with Ninja Turtles way back in the day as a kid, <laughs> and uh, I didn't want to do the mutant she didn't wrote. Uh, so what I did was the way this works is that the the ley lines and the ley roads of mana that flow through the land. They tend to fray in certain areas. It's kind of like a more wild magic, and uh, we have like in most worlds where they have different, different um, terrains and different different uh, ge- geographies. This one was more of the wild, and in the wild, these animals were, you know, living freely until the the wild magic started to turn them more bipedal, mm-hmm. and uh, and then they just became uh, an entire culture of bipedal yep. creatures, such as the wolves of the mantis. Uh, you know everything, everything, the rabbits, foxes, and they just a whole culture, a whole continent of these these things. And I think it's one of the major attractors, actually. Over the years of Legacy of Man, I've been playing it at Gen Con, uh, Dragon Con, Paxes. We've been we've had like you know dozens of GMs run for hundreds of people, and we've always had different groups of people get really into it. And uh, one of the major things that almost everybody unifies on is they love playing the, the Nemo's, the, the bears and the the lions and the tigers and the bears. Oh my! <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and it's always a different type of, type of D and D player that plays. Like the ones that are into the to the Nemo's, like the Nemo's, they're like really into it. And then the other groups like all into these Ultherian knights and the anti man and everything. And then every once in a while, and then you get these people that are so into time magic and they're just obsessed. And it's like. Everyone's got something that they get attracted to. Mm-hmm. Now, with that with that in mind, I'd like to go. I'd like to go into into some of the uh, cl- some of the classes. Now, you while you are ha- while you do, while you're going to be putting in a few new archetypes, I'd specifically like to bring bring up um, the cla- the class entries that you're that are going to be coming in, and mm-hmm. in particular, of course, since we've mentioned it a couple times, the Ethereum Knight. Mm-hmm. And what what yes. what first off what sort of fa- what sort of um, character fantasy is the Ethereum Knight meant to Im- meant to embody? They were originally inspired from the the old Highlander animated series. Um, well, they turned into that originally. Originally, they were inspired as just a group of evil knights that had the ability to reflect and bl- bounce magic, um, which was indicative of its inspiration in Final Fantasy III, but <clears throat> they were great. They were a great type of villain to have. I, I te- kept all the technology away from them and just strictly went with these these cool, like, you know, nowadays they have, like, uh, rune knights and stuff that can cast magic while using their swords and do cool stuff like that, but I wanted these guys to not like magic, and not that I want history to repeat itself, but I was definitely following up on some of that more imperial background where, you know, there was a genocide here. They wanted magic gone. Um mm-hmm. They had ruthless leaders with with bad agendas, and this is what they wanted to do. And it was a great plot hook uh, to to get, make it so that way all the heroes were heroes, and it wasn't Game of Thrones where everybody was politically killing each other. I was a bit milk toast back then. I didn't like friend betrayal, but you know, as kids, you want to all be the Avengers with all the drama. So we created a, a communally bad guy. Well, but then as time went on, and as it started to develop this into something that was more of an actual product, I didn't want to just make everything bad. Mm-hmm. And so we started putting the politics in there and started giving them more of the empire feel, and then defectors and 
you know, and then we put some, then we put actual logic and some actual design behind their, their ability to use these blades to deflect and bounce magic. Mm-hmm. And we decided, is this a class? Is this not a class? We developed it for Pathfinder. We developed, developed it for 4th edition. We did it for Savage Worlds. And yes, every single time it's like, yes, this needs to be a class. This shouldn't, this could be a subclass of a fighter. It could be a subclass of something else. But it's got enough uniqueness to it that it could be a class. And so that's what we ended up coming up with. Yeah, and truth be, truth be told, as as a bit of an aside, I um, I'm not the I'm not the biggest I'm not the biggest fan of the push to to take to take certain ideas and try and force them into being subclasses because sometimes when you do that, you end up with a square peg in a round hole. Right. Yeah, that was the thing. We we did have subclasses for a while, but it wasn't enough. Um, they were just a fighter that could bounce magic. It was kind of boring. And it's like, no, we got to give them some girth. We got to give them some reality to it. And the, I think the mechanics are like they're they're really fun to play. Uh, I've played one on stream several times, and I know a lot of people who play them. It takes a few minutes for them to grok around what they can do, mm-hmm. but it's like just playing a counterspell mage that can hold his own in a fist fight. And it's it's actually it's more than that, but it's actually like it feels really interesting when you know a party goes and interacts with simple things like a like a wall of force or. Uh, uh, how they can handle AOE attacks and, mm-hmm. and, 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 and mind affecting spells. And it just, it puts a layer to the game of chess between DM and players where there's a bunch of characters in the field and everyone's kind of taking their turn to figure out what action they're going to cast when and what they're going to do. And now you, you can't just cast a spell anymore because if there's no theory on the field, you got to time it in a way that you trick them to use the reaction before they start draining your spells. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's not just, you lose your spell like a counter spell war. But you lose your spell, and they gain a benefit, and then that benefit comes back to haunt you later. So, I used to describe it as if you're going to play like back in the years and years ago, when Pathfinder days, when we played at Gen Con, people always wanted to know the gist. They used to say, playing a magic user in the Ethereum Empire is like playing a paladin in Ravenloft. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you want to be a paladin and smite all the undead, but well, you're going to attract the big ones, right? You're going to, you're going to have a lot of uphill fight to do. Yeah. Now. There are now in the um, in the preview there are three there are three disciplines, basically the yep. subclasses for Eltherian knights that are, that are presented. And now, obviously, in that preview, you only all, all, the only thing that's mentioned is the third level benefits for each. But what sort of feel are what sort of feel are the Inquisitor, Defender, and Infiltrator um, disciplines meant to embody? So, like any army, they can't just be a bunch of, you know, knights that walk into a field and expect to take everything over. They, they've got a plethora of things to deal with. They have to play the game of chess properly. So, the defenders are your units exactly like they sound. They can, they can really manipulate the land by draining its mana and causing rough terrain. They can, they can uh, keep their army, they keep their soldiers alive by just being in the middle of it all and taking the brunt of things and, and blocking and defending, um, especially against magical attacks. The in, uh, the Inquisitor is the one that sort of sifts out where the uh, where the game is going to be played, like mm-hmm. you know subtle magic use, um, really well placed uh, magic against the party, things that can cripple a party, like lining up for a lightning bolt, things like that. They can mm-hmm. sift, they can they can sense the uh, the battlefield and sort of like act as a counter agent against those clever wizards that are hiding out behind the tree. Mm-hmm. Um, and the the uh, infiltrator is the one that actually isn't really in the front lines. They're always going into resistance groups and stuff and trying to figure out where good or magic, good or bad magic is being used and how to subvert it. Mm-hmm. Now, when it comes to, when it comes to sages, um, obviously sa- sages are, are, are a spell, are a spell casting class. But in that, in that regard, there's once again, I'd like to ask what sort of fantasy that they embody and, how th- and how they differentiate themselves from other casting classes? Uh, so they're actually closer to warlocks in that warlocks got some ability to use spells, and then they use uh, invocations. In this case, we have some ability to use spells, and we have something called manipulations, where they get to choose from a grand list of manipulations mm-hmm. to be able to manipulate time and manipulate you know, all kinds of interesting things surrounding time, temporal stuff. They are meant to be everything from your local seer with blind-eyed seer that's giving you everyone the, 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 the prophecy of the future all the way down to that 
um, person that walks in and suddenly goes into bullet time and can like just react to the entire battlefield because they see everything in slow motion. You know, mm -hmm. they're meant to be like we got our time monks and our time monks. Well, we call them time monks, but they're the past, uh, the path of the past, present, and future. These monks can go into a time dilation stance, which is like bullet time. So for us, we're sort of recreating that super empowered martial artist that can just like really engage the battlefield in a slow motion field to give you that that sort of action John Woo feel. And then you can go all the way to the one that wears, you know, the rice hat and looks like he belongs in some mountain in Japan that's giving away some sort of like prophecy that about the end of time or something and everything he speaks is in riddles and, and can, can stop time and do the, the Xavier thing where can pause time just to have a conversation with somebody without having it being impeded by being attacked or something, you know? Mm -hmm. Cool stuff like that. Yeah. Now... One thing that one thing that I find interest one thing that I find interesting is, um, unlike say w unlike say warlocks who have a set of spells that they cast at a ma at the maximum possible level for their well level, um, instead you have a spell point system in the form of augury points. Correct. What was the reasoning for taking that route? Um, the we felt that people that could see and manipulate time need to have versatility. They need to be more utilitary characters, but we did it in a way that didn't break the characters. We gave them a, their own spell list to choose from. Mm -hmm. We made it pretty stringent, and we worked around things that were time-based, like haste and slow, expeditious retreat, things that things that really mess with um, time-based effects. And giving them augury points allows them to build their spell list and do stuff to react throughout the day as they need to, as opposed to the memorization process of it, because these people are reacting to what we consider prophetic visions and or memories from the past that they never experienced that they should have that are coming and hitting them instantly, allowing them to do what they need to do. So that was our way of saying, this is sort of like an all in one manipulation. Instead of saying, read the future, augury points, mm -hmm. decide how you read the future. Right? Yeah. Now, I mean, okay. and sages are going to be a little like the chronomancer specifically. It's it's a there's a lot of classes in D and D that you play that you have to discuss with your DM before playing with because mm -hmm. some DMs don't know how to handle certain abilities. Yeah. The sage, specifically the chronomancer, is something that like you have to you're going to have to have a discussion with your party because if your DM is a dungeon crawl markers out five by five, you know mechanics thing, you can play it. But there are some abilities that are pretty, fairly abstract and are going to require some role playing and some actual like thought process in 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 what clues you can get away with. For you know, for example, object reading. Uh, these these characters can go up and they can live the last 10 to 15 seconds of an object's moment uh, of of its view and time. It can go into its time pocket and you can see what it experienced at some point in the past. And DMs need to be able to say, well, you know, the bad guys walked past here and this is what they looked like. Things like that. Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to, to play with some interesting mechanics that we found a way to quantify mechanically for those who just want to read the rules and play the game. But there's also levels of interpretation in there, like mm -hmm. using the spell Augury. Yeah. Now, when it comes to when it comes to Epiphany, the the spe the subtype that the subtype for the for um for sages, you you yep. presented three forms: Chronomancer, Dreamwalker, and Channeler. And much like I asked with the Knight, I'd like I'd like to ask what sort of theme that the that the three of them will have. Sure, the Dreamwalker is supposed to be the one that's going to play with time outside of the game a little bit. In terms of its abilities, they they are more functional at different points of the character's awakeness. Um, Functionally speaking, they, they still have a lot of things they can do on a regular basis, but uh, usually when, they, when people perform long rests and do stuff, it's usually a, a, a moment where people go and start doing dice rolling and stuff. Well, Dreamweavers can do mm -hmm. things to manipulate the next day a little bit mm -hmm. and have fun. Uh, Dreamwalkers, sorry. Um, they can also, in combat, do things like remove themselves from their body, not so much astrally as they are going into a bit of a sleep trance, and then start affecting the battlefield through the veil in, in sort of a dream realm. So... You know, sometimes these these classic tropes like Freddy Krueger and stuff say where or or in the like Matrix, whatever like whatever happens in one world happens in the other. Mm -hmm. They can do things like that and you bypass certain things. It's similar to like ethereal usage, but but different. Mm -hmm. um, the Channeler was our attempt at doing a sort of psionicist uh, combat monkey, where they're more into using their time abilities to warp the battlefield in a way that 
allows you know the the, the classic uh, Doctor Strange when a character's running at the other character and then the ground starts moving beneath them, but it's not actually the ground; it's just the time field around them as they're trying. They, it's like the forever run kind of thing, mm-hmm. things like that, where they can start manipulating the battlefield, uh, warping bullets and doing weird stuff like that. And the Chronomancer is your classic, your classic. What I think most people would believe a time wizard would be, um, doing really interesting but different utilitarian style uh, party elements, like uh, gathering information and reading minds and doing like more, more of that, that sort of prophetic Jedi thing. Mm-hmm. Now with, now within the, within the set, within the setting book, within the um, setting book, mm-hmm. um, there's a, there are, there are a fair amount, there are a fair amount of subclasses for all, for all of the base classes. Correct. Um, yep. Within the within those are there are there any um are, would you are there any classes that might that might be a bit since you mentioned the whole Ravenloft analog with paladins are there any um base classes that you base classes or, or even subclasses of base that might be a little bit tricky to implement into these settings not impossible just one with an asterisk. No, I think we we went and did for the base games and anything that's considered canon D and D. We we have went through and done a pretty solid check and made sure that we you know we, we did a cross examination. How does it play with this? How do these play with those? How do these play with this? Mm-hmm. I mean, there are certain modules and stuff that are reliant on magic being hidden, and if you're playing a party of Ethereum knights, you're going to destroy the the module instantly. But that's no different than other modules that are reliant on locks and stuff. And if you play a party of row, you can pick your way through it. Like it's 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 a game of like paper rock scissors. But we've, we did two balances of the game. First one is we balanced the game within itself. So chronomancers versus Ethereans versus sorcerers versus monks versus whatever, they all kind of have their paper, rock, scissors thing that they do best. Mm-hmm. Secondly, we tried to balance them against other worlds. So, and one of this was we were on Realmsmith TV. We, uh, I played uh, Time Paladin and Time uh, uh, Bard, uh, level three, level three. So I had both their skill sets, and I played in the Ravenloft module that Beetle and Grimm wrote with the Beetle and Grimm guys. Mm-hmm. And in the process of doing that, and I actually played along Alyssa Teague too, but I was the only one that was from Legacy of Mana. Everybody else was from published canonical Fifth Ed universe stuff. Mm-hmm. And I definitely changed the flow of the game, but it wasn't like a break or a freak out or a or this character's too powerful. In fact, the 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 Shade Walker that was with us was actually quite more, if you want to quote unquote it, like broken in terms of mechanics than I was, but I was definitely doing stuff to the game that most of the players didn't expect and or see. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so uh, one of our quotes that we got from Beetle and Grimm was that they actually thought that it was um, very well balanced to the other stuff that exists in the universe, and that was very important to me because I want to be self-conscious of the fact that, and I mean, there's always outliers to the situation, but I wanted to be self-conscious to the fact that if I'm going to play this game or put this game out in the market and people are going to see it and play it in their universes that I'm sure someone will find something and break something that we all do. Mm-hmm. But I wanted it to be as inclusive and yet as seamlessly fitting as possible mm-hmm. while feeling different than every other universe that we play in. Oh yeah. Now with that, with that in mind, given, given um, the fact that one of the maps is refer- is referred to as a mana dead zone, are there, cer- are there certain areas where, um, where having a heavy amount of spell casters in your party might put you at a disadvantage. Oh yeah, yeah. Just the same as in, in the world, believe it or not, there's actually the other way around. Where some cases are. Uh... Ooh, hold on, I was walking around outside there, freezing my face off here in Canada. Um, <laughs> the other thing was, uh, I might jump to my Bluetooth in a second. One sec. Mm-hmm. Sorry about that, guys. The problem with the convention thing. Coming home in the convention. Okay. Um, Still there? I didn't lose you, did I? Yeah, no, I'm here. You got it? Yeah. Okay, so... Um, what was the question again? <laughs> uh, it was it was more it was more about um the dis the disadvantage the disadvantage that might happen if um, oh. if if you have yeah. a bunch of casters in a mana dead zone. No, I mean it's it's no different than if you bring a bunch of fighters into a, a, a trap filled guild hall. You know, uh, you go if you're going to walk into a mana dead zone with a bunch of casters. Well, it's going to be a struggle. It's going to be a fight. 
Um, and it's, it's actually pretty much similar to, um, you know, if you bring a bunch of firearm experts into the, uh, the plant of fire, <laughs> expect, mm-hmm. you expect everything on you to go boom. Um, mm-hmm. But if you are going to go up against an Ethereum, like, you know, camp or, or fort or army or something, and you're playing a whole bunch of spellcasters, it's not undoable. And we've proven it on stream when I ran a game for six, uh, six episodes. We've proven it that uh, you can see spellcasters take out Ethereans in interesting ways. And, and, and I mean, mechanically speaking, the Ethereans use reactions a lot. Mm-hmm. That's the agency that we gave them. And a good old shock and grasp, if you can land one of those, the Ethereans lose their ability to use reactions, and you're pretty much now a fighter without any good feet. <laughs> mm-hmm. But that's just the trumpet game of, of Fifth Edition. That's the game that you play, right? Yeah. So it's still fun. Yeah. Now, one of one thing that is certainly going to make one of my colleagues happy is the presence of airships. And yes, there is a couple. Th- there's a couple things that I'd want that I'd want to ask on that front. One, within the within the book, is there going to be the possibility of custom of customizing um, a party's air, a party's um, personal ship if they end up getting one? Yes. In fact, we are building an entire modular system based on, you know, your carapace size and um, the type of hull and the mana crystals you have if you're using a, a ship from the flying lands or if you're going to make a steamship, you know, how much of what you need. We, we're we going to really go in an elaborate way and try and build out a airship building system mm-hmm. that we're not going to go crazy, crazy into. We're going to give you enough for you to really get into it, but... We do have plans for supplements in the future, so we're not going to go right down to the to the nines on it. But you'll be able to build a, a fairly customizable airship that will have hull and and hit points, and will understand how to do it in a way that is different than, than the way you've seen it to date. Mm-hmm. Now, the other the other avenue with the, with that is the is the question of ship combat. Are are you guys pl- are you guys planning on having a si- a system dedicated to ship to ship combat? Uh, yeah, so we have that in place already, including ramming speed, uh, use uh, using mana in various areas to enhance the way ships will get hit by their own spells versus steamships versus renic steel on these ships which absorb mana, mm-hmm. fall damage, collision damage. That's all part of the system. Yeah. Now, with with that with that kind of thing in mind, I'm guess I'm guessing that the speed of a lot of airships would be not too far removed from the speed of ships that um, ships that would be in the ocean. They're not exa- exactly they're not exactly we, fast. We, that's right. We built it off of nautical uh, understanding. However, we did, of course, like anything that involves magic. When you start doing nautical stuff and you, you use you know sails and wind and all that stuff as your as your qualifiers. And, you know, water and currents and everything. Mm-hmm. We did the same thing with our with our ley lines. Like ley lines are the magical currents of the sky that you can float upon, and magic can enhance things the same way haste can enhance a fighter or a species retreat to make you run faster. You know, it's like we do have ways to spend mana that will will give you the uh, the, the, the the ability to zip across the sky. But the problem is, is the ships that are in, that are full of mana, if you if you really give it, go far and burn all your fuel, you just fall. Mm-hmm. Now, since you mentioned currents, that's one of those things that can go that can go both ways when na- when navigating in the ocean. Um, right. Is there a, is there a similar kind, is there a similar kind of thing where there are certain um, ley line ba- ley line based hazards that are best avoided? Oh yeah, there'll be lots of fun stuff like that, including uh, pockets in the veil and stuff, and dimensional hops and things that can really get in the way. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm thinking. When I'm th- when I'm thinking of things best left avoided in, in the sea and applying that to ley lines, I'm thinking of the equivalent of say, um, rogue waves, squalls, maelstroms. Oh yeah, all the fun stuff. <laughs> oh. you know the ca- the kind of th- the kind of thing where where you need where that justifies how how specific navigation has to be, especially especially in the difference between say coastal navigate. Um, coastal navigation and ocean navigation. Right. Oh. Short version on that: you only have, to, you only have to update in ocean navigation. You only have to update your your heading every hour, whereas you have to do it every fifteen minutes on on coastal navigation just because of all the traffic. 
Right. Uh, so this year, I mean, we have we have a uh, crew checks. Mm-hmm. We have all the positions where people, players can take them and use survival skills, and and they can use navigators tools and stuff to help make it happen. And ley lines are are ley lines. I mean, you can follow them, and they'll take you where you need to go. We have a charter. We're, we're working on a chartered system where people know where the ley lines kind of take you. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, it's not going to be too in depth for this book, but it'll be a lot more in depth. Um, the supplement down the road when we actually go into the sky realms and, and, and really dig into that, that culture. Yeah, I I, fig- I figured that. Rome wasn't built in a day after all. Um, well, I mean, we've had it all, but we looked at it and we're like, man, we, we could do a 400-page book in no time, but realistically speaking and financially speaking, we've got to keep it to somewhere around 280 to 300. So we knew we had to make some chops, but we're like, hey, it's going to be thick enough for you to play a very functional, easygoing game the whole way through from level 1 to 20, and it will be very different. Mm-hmm. Um, and then if, if it works and it sells well, then you know we're gonna we're gonna keep going with it and keep putting cool cool projects out. Yeah, one of the other themes that I keep that I see ver- I see very present within the, within the work is is the concept of fate. And obviously, there, obviously, yeah. there's some aspect of it with what with the whole messing around with time thing. But I'm curious if the if there are if there are um, other mechanical uses for fate, like say. Like say that being an avenue, like say someone's fate being an avenue in character creation or something like that. Okay, so um, so what we've got here is an optional rule. So we didn't want to do, do too many things that was like an affect the core game of the edition. But we do have an optional rule of something that we're designing called Destiny System, where it's uh, it it actually uses the fifth edition inspiration point system mm-hmm. and allows us allows you to gain inspiration uh, more frequently. And then use the inspiration with a couple of charts to manipulate your destiny in, in various ways within the game, mm-hmm. such as adding, such as adding dice like bardic inspiration or rerolling dice in, in, in better quantities, or even so much as like maxing damage and doing other weird things like gaining rest abilities uh, on the fly because that's just what it is. But these, it's a very interesting um, uh, destiny system we've got. That, like I said, already uses the inspiration system that already exists in fifth edition, but just gives it a little more agency. Mm-hmm. Now, with that, with that in mind, um, what are you shooting for as far as a to- as far as the total page count for the f- for the setting guide? Oh, 280 minimum. Uh, if we get over to 320, then we're you know we're gonna have to make some hard cuts. But uh, we're we're gonna do our best to try and uh, not uh, squander the page size of the book. It's it's a fairly beefy book. Mm-hmm. I know most D and D supplements are about 225 to 240. Uh, we're going to be we're going to be probably a good eighty pages above that. Oh, all right. And when it comes to before, as a kind as a kind of capstone, I did want to touch briefly on the novel um, Strands of Destiny. Yeah. Now. So. Yeah. Was since you mentioned since you mentioned cre- essentially creating this setting before before you even knew about D and D. Um. How did how did the idea of of adding a of adding a supplemental novel um, come about? Well, to be honest, when I was in elementary school, when creative writing started to become a thing, uh, we had to write a two page uh, short story. It was one of our major major projects, elementary school projects. That's why it was such a major deal. Um, and uh, I started writing, and I didn't stop until I was 120 pages and two thick pens later. Uh, it was sloppy, it was a mess, but there was a story there. Mm-hmm. Um, the teacher really encouraged me to go forward, uh, and that's where this kind of stuff started to get born. And so I just took that document, and uh, I just kept rewrite it in grade nine, and I just tried to rewrite it again and again and again. And, and one of my best friends who's passed away, he rewrote it with me. Um, we tried to get it published, but uh, his writing was very doctoral, so it wasn't the right eloquence. Um, and then it had some iterations. And then finally, um, I decided to really take out the D&D side of it because it started to become very D&D-like. Mm-hmm. I took out the D&D side of it after putting the D&D stuff in it and went back to writing it like a, like a novel, writing it like an actual story and removing any of the, don't worry about the, 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 the mechanical side of things. Let's just make it like, a, like, a, like a, a good story now. And I hired an author who's well-accomplished and well-reviewed, uh, and I decided to just pay for it. <laughs> I said, you know, I'm just going to pay for this the right way. And you hire someone who's got some class and caliber who who has a professionalism to him and said, you are, please, please write this story in a way that makes sense. And we worked very close together. 
I gave them the what we would call it as the show bible or the, mm-hmm. uh, the, the the character descriptors and everything that has been developed for the last twenty some odd years or more thirty years at this point, and um, and uh, I said this is your this is your your please follow this this document. We came up with an Act One, Act Two, Act Three. We worked it all out. I got approvals along the way. He did a rough draft. Uh, I read the whole thing back to back, um, and the only way I can describe it to people is it's like it's as if I was watching all of my friends play a game that I was still dungeon mastering, that I still knew the end was coming, but had no idea how we were going to get there, and yet it still felt like I knew everything that was going to happen along the way, even though I still had that full, eyes closed anticipation of the book. It was the most surreal experience I had since watching my child be born. It was so real, so weird, and I was like, wow, this is that... This is what we're publishing. <laughs> Here we go. And that's it. Mm-hmm. And so in terms of what it is in lore for the story, uh, it is part of a trilogy. We're currently working on book two. Um, but all three of those books, basically when the third book ends, it's sort of uh, the, the, the RPG book starts five years after the book ends. So you're not really going to get anything given away other than like, hey, guess what? The big bad guy died. But, I mean... Um, it's kind of a, a priest, a precursor. If you want to get into more of the lore, and you really want to see sort of the Mary Sue of the universe go off, this is this is the uh, this is a great a great extra read. Mm-hmm. Now, with that said, what are you shooting for as far as a release window for the project? Not a not a release date, but a rough but a rough estimation. Well, that's the secret weapon there. Um, so we normally used to, as a board game designer, we've been designing products across the sea quite a bit. Uh, in China and or other other countries of manufacturing origin like this. But in this situation, uh, we were, uh, were a little more fortunate because we, we came upon a printer in our very hometown that has a proven record working in Dungeons & Dragons products already, and it was a, a business pivot from COVID. And so they went from posters and, and business cards to spending a very high amount of money in an infrastructure build-out to do really good quality work. And when I realized that the quality of work was already in sanctioned Wizards of the Coast product, I immediately went, okay, well, we don't have to worry about the, the stress test. We know we're going to get the quality. And since it's literally five minutes away from my house, uh, I'm going to cut down a lot of shipping. So my, my, uh, my, my release window for this, uh, the, the, the game itself is, is developed. The lore is being uh, continued to be worked on at the moment in terms of the fluff writing. Uh, the editing process will take a, a little while. And, uh, and then the art is, is about 85% done. We're just getting more pieces complete every, day, every week. But we are looking at a print window of, of I put on the Kickstarter uh, May, and I, I will hit that target, but I, I, I'm going to try and um, deliver it in March. Mm-hmm. It'd, be fun, it'd be funny if, you del- if the delivery date was March 4th, but that's the um, bad joke part of my brain talking. <laughs> What's that? March fourth, so you can so you can tell so you can tell people March fourth and open their PDFs. What? I'm missing something. <laughs> Sorry, my colleague is laughing beside me, but I don't I don't know what I'm missing. What am I missing, Josh? Walking, marching, four inch, four inch forward. Oh, March fourth! I get it. The pun, dude. You're amazing. <laughs> I love puns. My God, I, I, for some reason I thought it was like when PDFs were created or something silly. Yes, everybody, you can laugh at me. I'm that guy. That's crazy. <laughs> March fourth. You should. You <laughs> should thank. You should thank your. Co- you should thank your colleague because I wasn't going to explain the joke. Oh, that's even better! Wow, <laughs> he's doing the layout of the book. So, <laughs> yeah. um, but with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and dealing with dealing with the hell of time zones and, and all the other complications doing this particular kind of interview. Um, Oh, that's totally fine. I, I think I'm actually the one that's honored that you gave me the uh, the opportunity to do this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and anytime you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Well, I happen to own a couple of cafes called the Round Table, where we have <laughs> scotch and drinks as well. So if you ever get up to Canada, in my area of the woods, then... Uh, Consider the scotch on the house. Well, what what part of ca- what part of Canada are we talking? What province? So, uh, southern Ontario, about forty five minutes to an hour west of Toronto, uh, in a city called Guelph. Okay, okay, I'll get, I'll um, 
Well, for what for what it's worth, you're not the fir you're not the first guy in the um in the Tor in the Toronto grit in the Toronto area that I've ha that I've had in the temple. Um, I just I just I just have to I just have to deal with the awkwardness that well. Um, anytime I'm if I'm near Toronto, somebody's inevitably going to find out that I've spent that I've spent ten years picking on Leafs. Oh, don't worry. None of us <laughs> like the Maple Leafs either. <laughs> Second worst team in the world. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> yeah, and and well, what one of my di one of my dear colleagues here on the here on the podcast is um is in the is well, he's a Habs fan. That's my team. So your <laughs> colleague there, at, uh, you're, you're already a much better uh, podcast mm -hmm. just for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I so. I don't I don't pick particular favorites. I just I just like picking on everybody. It's just some people give me more ammo than others. No, I love it. I think that's fantastic. Oh. But no, I appreciate this. Thank you very much. Let yeah. me know. Send me all the socials and stuff, and I'll blast this across all the channels I can. All right. If, and all right. And of course, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then. On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>